Welcome back. So now we're going to talk about operational fiction, uh, excuse me, operational effectiveness as Michael Porter calls it, but it's also called operational efficiency in some bodies of literature. It's the same thing, okay? So once again, we're back to our production possibilities frontier. And Michael Porter, if you're reading the article, describes it very succinctly on, let's see, page three of the article. And he says it just like this. Operational effectiveness, OE, it means performing similar activities better than rivals perform them. Operational effectiveness includes, but is not limited to efficiency. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's use this red marker and let's use uh, blue and, let's use red and purple. Okay, let's say you've got two, two different companies. Okay, we're looking at this from an OE perspective again. The production possibilities frontier is the theoretical limit of your maximum production. Okay, the maximum amount of guns you can produce, best case scenario, the maximum amount of butter that you can produce, best case scenario. Now we're going to talk about butter, for example. That's obviously a dairy product. Dairy stuff comes from cows. So in the best wor possible world, a cow can produce this maximum amount of butter, but, or milk to make butter. But we know at the same time, well, cows get sick sometimes. You know, they're living organisms, so they may not produce as much milk as necessary. The factory that makes the butter, um, there may be a power outage. Um, maybe the workers go on strike. Um, maybe the equipment becomes uh, defective. Same thing with guns. You know, you think you can produce this amount of guns, but maybe there's an accident in some sort of a mine where you're getting coal to, you know, fire up the factories for making guns. Uh, maybe, again, the workers go on strike. So you're never actually going to hit this production possibilities frontier. Maybe your workers get sick. Maybe there's, you know, a coronavirus and your factories have to work at half capacity, right? So things never work the way that we actually want them to. The reality of it is actually probably this is the theoretical frontier, but the true ability of production might actually be all the way in here. Okay? Again, because of worker strikes, power outages, plague, four horsemen of the apocalypse. I mean, who knows? Right? There's all sorts of reasons that you don't always produce at maximum efficiency. So what we see here is we think that we're going to produce G1 and B1, but what actually happens, quite possibly, here's my green marker, what actually winds up happening is for the quantity B1, you produce quantity G1 alpha. Okay, so to produce that amount of butter, you're actually producing quite a bit fewer guns than you thought because again, there was a strike at the power plant um, and you couldn't get electricity to the guns uh, producing areas. Okay, so you may actually wind up producing much less than you actually thought. So the whole point of operational effectiveness or operational efficiency is to move as close to this production possibilities frontier as you possibly can. So let's say that you have, I've got this line here that's black, let's call this um, country A. And let's say country A is like a super high-tech country where everything works really, really well all the time, and there's still this gap. But let's say that you've got another country, and this is re relevant to the coronavirus pandemic, let's say you've got a country that has just been overrun by the pandemic and people are just dying like crazy, it's a disaster, right? You're obviously going to be really far from production possibilities frontier because you don't have workers you know, making guns, you don't have people tend to cows, the cows get hungry and they die because nobody's taking care of them, and so this other country's production possibilities frontier actually winds up looking more like that. So for them to produce, you know, they've got this quantity uh, G3, let's see we make that, and that's B3. You see, they wanted to produce a fair amount of guns similar to these other countries, but no matter what choices they make, pretty much, they're not going to be anywhere near their production possibilities frontier, and in almost all cases, they won't be able to produce as much as this country A. 
And this, uh, this purple one, that's going to be country B. So the whole point of operational effectiveness, especially if you're country B, you say, you know what, how do I shift my real or my actual production possibilities frontier towards A or actually move it ever closer to this hypothetical frontier? How do we just totally maximize our efficiency? Okay. Now, some of you are probably asking yourself, wait, if you introduce a new form of technology, what does that do? Okay. Like, um, let's say that there's a better com computing system that, you know, makes production faster. Does that move you to closer towards it? Well, no. Because you assume operating conditions based on everything that you have now. So, based on all the technology that we have today, you know, today's what, uh, you know, 2021, based on all the technology that we have right now in 2021, this is our production possibilities frontier. Now, I know that in 2022, there'll be better technology, but what that means is that this frontier is just pushed outward. The hypothetical uh, uh, production possibilities frontier is, out, is moved outward, and then the individual companies or countries, like such as country B and A, as they can produce or acquire that new technology, then they can continue to move further and further. In fact, they may even move past the old curve, but they'll never quite get to this hypothetical curve. That's the whole point of operational efficiency or operational effectiveness. Right. Now, one of the things that I don't like about this article at all is, and I really don't know why he said this, but if you look at page five, there's this whole thing about Japanese companies rarely have strategies. Um, and he says, like, basically all the Japanese companies can do is produce things better. Well, first of all, there's a little bit of context that I think, you know, Michael Porter's do. You know, he grew up in an era, probably, when I grew up, I mean, he was a professor in the era of the 1980s. And those of us that were alive then probably remember when Japan was producing electronics and manufacturing like crazy. I mean, they were doing a fantastic job of just manufacturing and production, right? So part of that is there is this hypothetical production possibilities frontier. And if you look at two countries like the U.S. at you know, Part A and Japan at Part B, well, yeah, so, um, excuse me. You could look at the U.S. as you know, production possibility curve B and Japan's production possibility curve A. So their manufacturing capability was already better than ours, but they were also rapidly innovating and, and uh, providing brand new technologies so that the curves were moving further and further out, but because they were the ones developing it, that individual technology, because they were the developers of the new technology, the manufacturing technology, the manufacturing processes, etc., they were able to continue pushing ever closer towards these new production frontiers that they were the ones creating, and we were struggling to keep up as uh, Americans, right? So that's, so he's partially right that they focus on operational efficiency or operational effectiveness. However, I would not say that that's not having a strategy. By focusing on that so much, they are generating competitive advantage, right? Because they're producing, yes, it's true, they are producing similar goods and services at a, at a you know, better, faster, cheaper rate, but their strategy of producing and focusing on OE is generating a competitive advantage, which is valuable. And that was the secret to their success. The other thing that Michael Porter forgets is the fact that we have what we call discrete or embedded or network strategy. So discrete strategy is very common in, in, in Western societies where you take one company like Ford or GM if you're looking at automobile manufacturers and they're focusing on, okay, Ford's going to be the best it can be and it's going to compete with GM and all these others, plus they got to compete with companies in Japan and things like that. The Japanese companies look at network or embedded strategy. In other words, Mitsubishi, Honda, and all these companies get together with their suppliers, with their different stakeholders, and they find ways to work together to beat the competition in other countries. Right? So they very much have a, a strategy that's very alive and well. It just doesn't look like the kinds of strategies that we see or saw in the United States. So it is a strategy, it's just a very different one. Either way, it's generating competitive advantage. Yes, Honda might not be as successful 
as Mitsubishi in the short run, but in the long run, everybody in Japan has more because they focus on beating the companies in all the other uh, rival countries. So again, operational effectiveness and operational efficiency is doing the same or similar activities in other companies and doing so, uh, trying to do it at a better, faster, cheaper rate, doing these similar activities. The production possibilities frontier can continuously be moved out based on new processes, new innovations, new technologies. And of course, as the curve moves out, you as a company can also try to move out. Okay? And so you can actually produce more along the way. Michael Porter in the article kind of says, well, no, you know, you have to make trade-offs. Well, in a way you do between guns and butter, but you can also have a strategy of focusing on moving that curve out through innovations. And yes, it's true. Let's look at country... Uh, Let's look at country B here. You know, if everything stays the same, you've got to make these same two trade-offs. But let's say that company B hires a, a great management consultant, like Dr. D, you know, that's me. Let's say they hire me, and I'm pretty good with Lean Six Sigma, and I come up with a bunch of new mechanical engineering technologies, uh, processes, etc. And I then move their curve out like that. Well, would you look at that? Now, they can produce maybe not more butter, but they can produce more guns. And if they want to move back here and produce the same amount of guns, they can produce more butter because we've moved that curve out. And focusing on uh, not so much product innovation, but process innovation has its upsides, again, because you are able to produce more. So I think Michael Porter is a little off on this. Uh, Michael Porter, if you're watching this video, if you have some comments, uh, please post them down below. I'd definitely uh, like to hear from the expert, but this is kind of my interpretation of it. So I've explained this a few different ways. A lot of my students seem to get tripped up by this. If you have any questions, though, post them down in the comments below, and make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. I'm a starving YouTube creator. And the next video, we're going to kind of compare this approach to one based on strategy. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video.